This is Duxford Aerodrome, home to a thriving part of Britain's Imperial War Museum. It's also the operational base of the beautifully restored Messerschmitt Bf 109 Black 6, the only remaining Gustav or G variant still flying. On the 12th of July 1991, Black 6 arrived here from Benson Airfield to take its place in one of the world's foremost centres of aircraft restoration and preservation. With over 130 flying and static aeroplanes on display, it's Europe's largest collection of its kind. Duxford's purpose as a living and working museum is to preserve for us now and for future generations historic aircraft like Black 6. We preserve old aircraft because they can help us interpret to future generations the history of warfare in the 20th century. And our job is just to show what happened, tell what happened, uh, and let people come to their own conclusions, and uh, not so not glorify it. These six hangars contain Black Six's stable mates, veteran aircraft from every major conflict in the 20th century. Many survived combat and then years of neglect before being brought here for restoration. Chris Chippington, the museum's conservation manager, coordinates this work. I'm responsible for the, the preservation of all the uh, exhibits which belong to the museum here on site at Duxford. We have to make the distinction between uh, restoration and conservation. Um, restoration is restoring it back to a condition that it was in previously. Uh, conservation is uh, trying to conserve it, maintain it in its existing state. As far as this particular aircraft is concerned, um, it's the only um, currently flying German World War II aircraft in its original condition. Being able to include Black Six as an exhibit on the museum site is only one side of the story. Operating such a unique aircraft is the responsibility of airfield manager David Henshaw. Well, I think it actually works quite well. Um, Ministry of Defence are responsible, having given us a signed agreement, that their main responsibility to the aeroplane uh, is to supply us with pilots. Russ's team are entirely re responsible for the engineering uh, backup and support. My job in the Imperial War Museum's job is, first of all, to get the bookings, to do the administrative side of the air display work that the aircraft gets involved in, or to basically to market it, I guess. Uh, we look after the insurance, uh, and uh, we pay the bills, but then on the other side of the coin, we take the money. Duxford's responsibility is now to care for and to operate Black Six until the expiry of the agreement with the MOD. But how this aircraft came to be restored so authentically and to flying condition, is Russ Snadden's story. I looked at this thing and I thought, well, if anybody was going to ask, which they did, like the Chief of Air Staff in his official visits, how long is it going to take Snadden? I say, casually, five years. I've since come to regret that little statement. The history of Black Six can't be fully understood without first gaining some realisation of the development and historical background of rearmament in post-World War I Germany. Basically, the 1990 Versailles Treaty was, was the, the treaty that limited German operations after the war. They permitted them to have a certain amount of civil aviation, um, and uh, gliding was permitted and things like that, but all military aircraft were either destroyed or handed over to the Allies. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. They reached an agreement, I think it was in 1923, with the Soviet government. And the Soviet government permitted them to have, obviously, a clandestine training uh, base, I think about 200 miles east of Moscow. Uh, and that's where they, for about nine years from 24 onwards, they actually trained uh, pilots, observers, engineers. In Germany itself, the main training role was with gliders. There was about 50,000 people that were it formed part of the gliding school by about 1929. And there was literally there was thousands of people that were, were trained to fly gliders and then could also be developed on to fly uh, high performance aircraft. Lufthansa were using and designing uh, aircraft that could have a dual purpose. Uh, the Dornier 17 
and the Heinkel 11, the two leading German bombers of the early part of the war, both were developed as high-speed mail planes and passenger-carrying aircraft. Uh, this Junkers 52 that we're standing beside was originally designed as an airliner, single-engine airliner, and fitted with three motors, and it was used as a bomber. The only type of aircraft that were allowed to be designed and built in Germany also trained very many people to fly. So the, by the time 1935 came around and the German Air Force was officially unveiled, um, there were something like 20,000 men that were able to serve. On the 10th of March, 1935, an interview with Goering was printed in the British press. He stated, it is not the creation of an offensive weapon threatening other nations, but rather a military aviation strong enough to repulse attacks on Germany. Germany was still prohibited from having a military air force, but I think a lot of people realize that it, it in fact was going on in places such as Duxford had been redeveloped uh, in 1929 and, and in the early 30s because we'd begun to recognize that Germany was going to be a potential threat. Blenheims and Hurricanes, like these beautifully restored examples from the Duxford-based Aircraft Restoration Company and the Sea Hurricane team, were growing in number here in Britain. In Germany, the newly formed Luftwaffe had settled on one design as their frontline fighter. The BF-109 was the brainchild of Willy Messerschmitt. The German Air Ministry issued a specification for a monoplane fighter to replace their biplanes. And there were four that were submitted. The Arado and the Focke-Wulf were fairly quickly eliminated from the competition as being not, not likely to be suitable. But the Heinkel and the Messerschmitt were both given a development contract for 10 prototype aircraft. And in fact, many people in Germany, I think, thought at the time the Heinkel was more advanced, uh, was a, a potentially greater, more suitable aircraft. I think partly because Heinkel had greater experience in building military aircraft. Don't forget, Willy Messerschmitt had never built a military aircraft, uh, apart from his uh, Messerschmitt 108, which was really a communications aircraft. So they, they, they was a bit of a long shot to go for this untried designer. Um, certainly proved to be correct with 33,000 Messerschmitt 109s being built. The Spanish Civil War was to be the proving ground for the Luftwaffe. In the late, late, late stages of 1936, the Condor Legion was formally formed. And the Germans unashamedly used the Spanish Civil War as a development, place, place of development of their aircraft and their tactics. Uh, and so they, they really had a, a, a big step in advance of the rest of the world when the Second World War broke out because they, they'd proved most of their current frontline aircraft in service in combat. In total, over 30,000 109s of different marks were built. The type remained in service for 30 years and saw combat in every theater of World War II and beyond. The last 109s to retire were the Bouchons, like this one, restored by the old flying machine company in German markings, Berlin engine Messerschmitts that saw service up until the 1960s and beyond. In September 1942, this Messerschmitt was just one of the many to come off the production line of the Erler Maschinenwerk near Leipzig. The fact that we know this, and almost all of Black Six's history from that date, is a further tribute to Russ Snadden and the 109 team's attention to detail. Well, tracing the history was a, a start. I think. We had no idea where the aircraft was captured or, or it's, it's Luftwaffe history. Russ knew that this 109 had been operated by 1426 enemy aircraft flight at Collie Weston during 1944. This rare archive shows it in flight during evaluation tests. But the supposed story of its capture left Russ with many doubts. And the official tale was that it had been captured in Sicily in 1943, I think it was, and I could find no records at all of that, that being so. It was unlikely that such an early 109 G2 as this would have been in Sicily at that time, when the more heavily armed G6 was in service at the fall of the island. The sand we found in the thing indicated it was probably in the desert. We found lots of sand in the wings and in the wheel well doors and all that sort of thing. So it had to be the North African desert. In November 1976, a photograph appeared in Air International magazine submitted by Group Captain Keith Isaacs of the Royal Australian Air Force. His letter revealed that this 109 was flown by Squadron Leader Bobby Gibbs at Gambut, Cyrenaica. 
This was the first breakthrough in the search for Black Six's true history. But not only that, I found a chap who'd captured the aircraft, who is retired now and lives in Sydney. And through him and through establishing contact with him, I came up with several photographs from his album and it established beyond doubt that it was our aircraft. Having established the point in time at which the aeroplane fell into Allied hands, it was then possible to start piecing together its history, first in North Africa and then in England. On the 13th of November, 1942, Flight Lieutenant Ken McRae, Engineering Officer, 3 Squadron, Royal Australian Air Force, discovered Black Six where it had been left by the retreating Germans on Gambit Main Airfield. He reported it as shot up with damage to tailwheel, tailplane, canopy and one propeller blade, radio, oxygen unserviceable and some instruments missing. The following day, repairs were carried out and three squadron markings, CVV, the personal codes of Bobby Gibbs were applied in readiness for his first flight in the 109G on the 15th. Gibbs flew Black Six to Gazala Satellite and on to Martuba on the 19th, escorted, as all captured aircraft had to be, by two Kitty Hawks. He was obviously impressed by the 109. His diary reads, The 109 is a hell of a nice kite with a terrific performance. Bobby's plan was to ship his 109 back to Australia as a war trophy, but his prize was required elsewhere for performance and evaluation trial. This was the first serviceable BF 109G to be captured, and at that time it was outclassing all the opposition, including the Spitfire Fives. And following an order from AOC, he delivered it to Heliopolis. There, an engineering attachment 451 Squadron, Royal Australian Air Force, took charge of the BF 109G. On the 15th of December 1942, Group Captain Mungo Buxton flew the 109 to Lydda, Palestine, for evaluation tests. It remained there until it was ferried to Kasferit for tactical trials. Black Six's last recorded flight at Kasferit was a mock dogfight with the Spitfire 5C on the 24th of February, 1943. Sometime after that, the station salvage section prepared and packed the 109 for shipment to England. On the 26th of December, 1943, a very badly damaged packing case containing the 109 arrived with 1426 enemy aircraft flight at Collie Weston. Apart from a missing propeller, the 109 was, to quote Lofty Westwood, fitter 2A, very untidy and damaged due to bad handling and crating in an unsuitable crate. After several weeks plundering parts from other captured and crashed 109s, ground runs were completed and the aeroplane was redesignated Romeo November 228. On the 19th of February 1943, RN228 made its first flight from Collie Weston flown by Flight Lieutenant Lou Lewenden, seen here with Doug Goff, another of the 109's pilots whose name appears often in 1426's log. RN228 spent the rest of the war with 1426 flight. This film, found in the Imperial War Museum archive, is now one of the rarest records of Black Six's Royal Air Force career. RN228's main roles with 1426 were photographic sessions, evaluation tests, and tactical trials against Allied aircraft. But as Russ Snadden explains, in 1944, it was put to a new use. Towards the end of the war to show, <coughs> particularly the Americans, how to disable aircraft that they would come across in Germany without ruining them, basically. And so if they showed them a particular part of a German aircraft that they could immobilize, that would stop it op being operational, uh, the idea being subsequently if any evaluation teams came over any aircraft which was perhaps interesting then with a minimal of rectification they could get it fine. 109 flew a tour of American and British airfields in this new role during 1944 and continued flying sporadically due to periods of unserviceability up until March 1945 when Doug Goff flew RN228 for the last time from Collie Weston to Tangmere following the disbandment 1426 flight in January. Ross now knew Black Six's history in Allied hands. 
but his ambition was to restore this aircraft as authentically as possible with its original equipment, camouflage, markings and insignia. During many hours of research at the Public Records Office, a document emerged that revealed the original German serial number, 10639. Andy Stewart of British Aerospace, who'd helped Russ in the past, then took up the search through the Bundesarchive in Koblenz. The information they supplied corresponded with Allied records of the capture of the 109 and established the Luftwaffe history of Black Six. Having left the Erler Maschinenwerk in Leipzig, work number 10639 was accepted by the Luftwaffe on the 13th of October 1942 and collected by three Jagdschwader 77 at Munchenriem Airfield. From here it was flown to northern Italy en route to North Africa. Lieutenant Heinz Ludemann was a young pilot who trained with the Luftwaffe during 1941. In 1942, he was on active service in Russia, flying this BF-109F with the 8th Squadron of the 77th Fighter Group. In Luftwaffe terms, 8 Staffel Jagdschwader 77. Heinz's tour of duty in Russia lasted until mid-October 1942, when his unit was withdrawn from the Eastern Front for redeployment to the desert. They flew their BF-109s to Munich, and after some home leave, collected their new BF-109 Gustavs to follow the route through Italy to North Africa. Heinz normally flew Black 4, but it's quite possible that Black 6 flew with his unit to the desert. Black 4 was unserviceable, and Heinz flew Black 6 in combat with P-40 Kitty Hawks, similar to this example from the fighter collection. According to Ludemann's diary, he sustained slight injuries to his head and body during this action, but he managed to return Black 6 to the airfield at Cote Fire, leaving it there and continuing by road west, only just ahead of the Allied breakthrough at El Alamein. Black 6 was ferried by an unknown pilot to Gambit Airfield, 200 miles away, for repair. But the Allied advance was too swift, and it was abandoned following the removal of vital equipment. Heinz Ludemann was killed in combat with P-40s over Tunisia on the 10th of March, 1943. His nephew, Heinz Langer, attended the rollout ceremonies in May 1991 at Benson and gave an account of his uncle's career before presenting Russ Snadden with two of his uncle's medals. Black Six is, as it was when Heinz Ludemann last flew it in combat, an accurate restoration of an Axis fighter in the desert campaign. But in its post-war life, it suffered from several, as Russ describes them, very imaginative paint jobs, which were applied for appearances on Horse Guards Parade during Battle of Britain Week. In 1961, the BF-109G went to Wattisham, where a proposed rebuild was started by one of the flight lieutenants stationed there. His idea was to restore the thing to flight, uh, only he was going to do it in six months, you know. Uh, that puts the whole thing in perspective, really. Uh, he was going to fly it with bolted, the legs bolted down with a big bar between them to hold it down. He was going to throw all the, which he subsequently did, he threw all the German instrumentation and the panelling away and put in a basic piece of aluminium with basic British instruments in it. Suffice to say, after some months, he put it to the board uh, to assess his board at whichever command it was in these days. And they said, no way, sunshine, and put it back together again the way you got it. The 109 returned to static display and spent a further 10 years appearing in various fictional guises at open days around the country. On the 30th of September, 1972, Russ Snadden inherited the BF 109 G2 that we now know as Black Six. Its arrival at Lynham marked the end of Russ Snadden's search for a suitable aircraft to restore and the start of 22 years hard labor for Russ and his team. I'd been involved in preservation for 20 years, for 20 years by that stage. Firstly, through one of the first preservation societies in the country, Historic Aircraft Preservation Society which is sadly gone now, but we managed to save lots of aircraft like Lancaster, Walrus, Corsair, Seafire, Sabre, all through 
donations from the people who own these things. Uh, it's changed days now, they cost a fortune, but in these days people were glad to get rid of them. But that fell asunder when I was uh, with the service in Singapore. But then I found myself on the Comet Squadron at Lynham, and the lifestyle there was such that you would go around the world for about um, two weeks, three weeks, and have a similar amount of time in between trips. So I thought I could make use of this time in restoring all the aircraft. And the 109, I have to say, wasn't my first target. Uh, my first target was a Fokker Wolf 190, which uh, is still one of my favorite aircraft today. First I saw of it, uh, it was at RAF Lynham where I was stationed, um, and it had been delivered from RAF Watersham in uh, Suffolk in the back of two Hercules transport aircraft. One Hercules brought back the uh, fuselage complete with propeller, and the other one brought a pair of wings back. And the first I knew of it was um, a little corporal in the customs shed ringing me at my quarters uh, on the base saying, do you know anything about a ne Messerschmitt 109, sir? To be perfectly candid, I'd only seen the pictures of the aircraft. I'd never actually seen the aircraft myself. And it looked, sorry, dilapidated, but nothing irrecoverable, I thought. Inside it had been totally gutted. There was nothing really of use inside the airplane at all. The engine was in a sorry state, externally at least. Lots of bolts were missing, pipes were bent, damaged, broken. Um, undercarriage legs, so both deflated. Well, one was deflated and the other was up, so it was sitting with a terrible lopsided attitude to it. The more I got into it, the more despondent I became. I felt like ringing Watish and saying, can you take it back, please? Unbeknown to Russ, Ian Mason had already made his first contact with the BF-109. I was corporal in charge of duty crew when one of the lads came up and said, some idiot's got an ancient aeroplane down at movements and we've got to go and get it and shove it up the pan. So in actual fact, I was one of the people who pushed it in the hangar when it arrived from Watish and it went in circles all the time. You had to push it for about 50 feet, then drag the tail sideways and push it again, because one leg was completely collapsed and the other one was still hanging onto a bit of pressure. Uh, and at that point is when you start, became aware of bits of brown paper stuffed in the wing roots and uh, cardboard fairings held on with self-tapping screws. And so, yeah, it was in a pretty bad shape. Having got his 109 and survived the initial shock, Russ started work. So my primary intention was to restore it as accurately as I could. Uh, the secondary thing was just a little thought in the back of my head. If we found it was OK, why not fly it? Because there wasn't one. The next stage really was to investigate uh, all the damage and what we could do with it and all the rest of it. But at this stage, having cleaned the fuselage down and looked at the very superficial corrosion we'd got rid of, it all looked nice, and suddenly the, the rug was pulled from under, and 216 Squadron disbanded, and I was faced with a move somewhere. I knew Northolt of old. It's a tiny little airfield with not a lot of hang ridge and lots of airplanes, and I thought my chances of shoehorning even a small Messerschmitt 109 there must be remote. Right. And I was very surprised contacting the, both the station commander and the engineer officer said, bring it along, we'll put it in somewhere. I wasn't particularly happy. I didn't particularly like Brooks. And... Uh, I got a phone call one day from a squadron leader at MOD saying, did I know a flight lieutenant Snadden? Yeah. Um, did I wish to continue working on the 109? Yeah. So you'd be happy with the posting to Northolt, certainly. He's very persistent, very good at his letter writing. Russograms are called in the trade. <laughs> Ian and Russ had spent most of their spare time at Lynham cleaning and preparing the Gustav. It looked lovely at this stage. Um, that was the fuselage. The fuselage had been done. One wing had been done externally. The other wing we hadn't touched. Um, the engine by this stage had gone to Rolls-Royce at Bristol Filton just down the road. They volunteered to have a look at it for us. By this time, Russ and his 109 were becoming well known. But how did the Royal Air Force regard the project and its use of official space and equipment? I only agreed to take the aircraft on provided Everybody stayed out of my hair. I wasn't having anyone breathing over my shoulder every inconvenient moment. And also that they put no time limit on it because uh, having been involved in restoring aircraft in the past to a, a more superficial degree, anything that you reckon might take two days generally took a week. So as a result of that, I'm glad to say that they, both the MOD and the Air Force uh, from a higher level kept out of my way. There tended to be a bit of uh, interference, basically because, of course, we were using hangar space, which 
really should have been used to service the operational aircraft of that station and not restore a museum aeroplane. I could see the point of view. It was irritating, nevertheless. Having established my ground rules, the other side of the coin was they established their ground rules. The coin's an appropriate phrase, can't you think of it? And that was that uh, they would have, they would just give no public funds towards the restoration. Anything that had, was done had to be done voluntarily and by uh, people giving their time and parts and all the rest of it, uh, which didn't bother me at the time. But then, as I said to you, um, having seen inside the aircraft and seeing just how much was missing, uh, then it started to worry. <laughs> Ian's not known for his gift of the gab, but somehow he managed to win over about three of his team members uh, on the south side of the airfield. He was responsible for seeing in and servicing, to a minor degree, the uh, visiting aircraft. And uh, he managed to cajole them into coming along to have a look at the 109. And fortunately, out of the three, two became regular members of the team for a couple of years. And that really did help. Up until 1977, the team were fitted in to the hangars at Northolt. But then, very suddenly, they were ordered to move out. Their new accommodation came as a shock. Uh, the medieval conditions we had at Northall. We were in a little blister Nissen hut, which really couldn't be termed a hangar in any sense of the word. There was no heating, very few, little lighting. No water, no toilet facilities. Holes in the roof. Now I'm well out of the Air Force, I can probably say we got our electricity by opening a fuse box, putting 100 yards of cable, shoving the leads into the fuses, bang the fuse back into position, switch the fuse box back on and run everything off the one lead. Despite the problems, work progressed over the next few years. Cleaning and assessment of the fuselage and wings reached completion and reconstruction started. The fuselage was now complete with tail and front bulkhead, all painted in the original primer, identified and found by Russ after much research. The team now turned its attention to the wings. Although these had passed non-destructive testing, along with the main spar, the D-frames and the tail, they still required a lot of attention. An addition to the team in 1978 was John Elkham. I was officially invited in by Ian after he'd seen me photographing the Gate Guardian Spitfire. He said, do you want to come and photograph a real aeroplane? So I said, what it, why? What have you got? And he said, a Messerschmitt 109. You'd have to, be, I would have thought, been a really knowledgeable person to recognise the piece of metal that I saw. It was just a bare, rubbed down fuselage which was firewall to just before the tail, where the tail disconnects. And I'd no sooner said there's anything you want clean while I'm here, I've got, you know, Sunday's the whole day off, I'm not doing anything. And Scotch Bright's in the hand, and there's a piece of pipe given to me before I knew what had happened, sort of thing. And it went on from there, literally. Availability of bits was sometimes something that you thought, will, you know, will we ever find whatever? It wasn't a case of knowing that there was a bit missing and going to the local store and buying it. That was almost like an act of faith. You just carried on doing something else and, and hoped to God it would turn up by the time you got stuck. And, and luckily, basically, it always did. One source of parts was the Swiss Air Force, who, together with Pilatus, had developed the P2 trainer from their stock of redundant 109Es. I contacted them and they said, well, you'll have to make an official uh, approach for that and offer something in exchange. Well, I couldn't offer anything in exchange. And I approached the RAF Museum and said, look, can you help? And fortunately, it all worked because before that, the Swiss Air Force had given the RAF Museum a, hem a de Havilland Venom fighter and in exchange for which the RAF gave very little and they felt guilty about it at the time. So this was an opportunity to redress the balance and they found what the Swiss particularly wanted, which was a, a Napier Sabre engine. And that was stuck in a crate sent to Switzerland and in exchange we got three crates of spares back, which included a complete set of undercarriage legs from the Pilatus P2, rudder pedals, all the hydraulics we wanted, tires, wheels, brakes, everything we really, it was Christmas come early that year, I tell you. He's a tremendous scrounger, beggar, and uh, writer of letters. Um, he's got things that I regularly thought there's no way. Uh, and he's turned up and eventually got what he was after. He's, he's very persistent. In 1980, Russ's commission came to an end. So, uh, technically, I was still in charge. Um, but of course, I now live something like an hour and a half's drive away. So it made it not very easy to, to work on the aircraft or even to coordinate the work that was being done. 
But on top of that, Ian Mason, because uh, the Falklands, uh, well, this was after I left the Air Force, but Ian Mason left to go down to Ascension Island when the Falklands crisis blew up, so I lost him subsequently. Mm -hmm. And the members of the team that we had gathered together in the years at North Hope, they left, uh, one on posting, the other one into Civvy Street. So slowly the team went down to virtually nothing again, really. And also at that stage, um, interests were being shown. Um, I shouldn't go into too much detail, but there were various senior officers who were starting to take a, an inordinate interest in the 109, which everybody ignored for 30 odd years before. People who were obviously trying to uh, hijack the project is one that always sticks in your mind. And there was a lot of interest there. So subsequently, um, I was summoned to uh, the station commander's office and told that I'd have to move the aeroplane. Uh, whether the two were connected, I know not. Um, but at that stage, the squadrons at Northolt were re-equipping or getting more equipment, and space at, in hangars was becoming more and more scarce. In July 1983, the 109 was on the move again, this time to Royal Air Force Benson in Oxfordshire, its third home in 10 years. I was given about five weeks to get it off the station, and during that five weeks, I heard that uh, we could have space at Benson. I then went to the station commander, who I thought was a nice friendly officer until about then, and asked for a Queen Mary, one of these long articulated trucks to take the aircraft to Benson. And eventually I was offered a, a three-ton truck and a trailer. I dreaded what might arrive at the other end, I might add, because I could see all sorts of things happening en route and, and offloading, but there was really little damage at all. Ian, by the stage, uh, had long since left us because of his postings in the Air Force and all the rest of it. Um, I managed to uh, induce, cajole, interest some other people in the new hangar I was in. And uh, the first of those was a chief technician called John Dixon. The first I knew about it, it was planted in the hangar outside the, the little beer where uh, I worked. The, um, the undercarriage legs were the first thing we worked on. And I said, yes, yeah, certainly it was. And he, he showed me what he had, was which, uh, which were um, two original legs off the aircraft, which were supposedly serviced and capable of uh, holding oil and, and air, you know. And when we tried that, it all ran out the bottom. <laughs> and he had another set of legs off a Pilatus aircraft, which are exactly the same, licensed, built by the Swiss. So we had spare legs to play with and look at, and uh, we took it from there. Uh, we resealed the legs, put oil in them, charged them up, and whoopee, we got them to all the oil and put the air in, and we had a fully serviceable set of legs. Some weeks later, a corporal called Paul Blacker took an interest. He was an airframes man, magic with his hands. And I just went along, introduced myself, asked him if I could do anything, and he said, yeah, help yourself. <laughs> so I, I picked the, the grossest looking parts on the rack and took them away came back days later with them totally rebuilt, which astonished us at the time. And I just took more and more panels away. And then just as he came in sort of week after week, there were more and more restored bits on his rack waiting to go on the aircraft. And they've become two firm members of the team. Um, sometime afterwards, and well into the time when the aircraft was really starting to take shape again, <coughs> Ian Mason turned up at Benson on his last posting before leaving the Air Force. It's a tradition in the service that uh, you're given a choice of your last posting. And I walked in the hangar door and basically slap bang in front as I walked in through the hangar door with my arrival card in my hand is a 109. Having found a reasonably safe haven and a new team for his 109, the next few years saw some incredible progress. We were there until uh, we moved the airplane, which was in 90, well, it was 10 years basically, just under 10 years. Time flies when you're having fun. Physically, there was no reason why it shouldn't fly. All through the restoration, we hadn't found anything, really, that would stop it flying. It was in, although it looked horrible when I got it, uh, physically it was in good shape. Um, we had to do very little repair to the airframe to make it ready. It was merely a, a task of finding all the bits that are required to restore the thing properly. The first system we had serviceable, which I'm uh, thinking about it now, was the, the brake system which followed from fitting the legs. And it's a very simple system, um, a static line braking system, hydraulic, just like you have on your car. And from there, we fitted the wings. But actually putting them on the airframe 
fantastic. Putting the wings on. I've never seen an aircraft with its wings on. It arrived in the back of Hercules with wings in one and fuselage in the other. And, uh, of course, the two were never mated. Seeing one wing on, and then about a couple of months later, seeing the other wing on. Started getting the controls to operate up and down, you know, getting the range of movements. And it was good, you know, from there it sort of blossomed forth. By February 1988, the airframe was largely rebuilt, ready to accept the contents of the Rolls-Royce lorry that arrived at Benson. This great big yellow box turning up. And when we sort of took the lid off, inside was this gleaming engine. And this rather delightful piece of engineering appeared out of this box, glistening, you know, lovely gloss black. Very nice, gleaming, sparkling, shiny engine. And then we had to sort of hold back for about two months before we actually fitted it. And that was the next major uh, step, seeing the engine on. First time in 40 odd years. Uh, an engine had been fitted on a 109. We looked at it for a while and then hung it on the front and we were quite surprised at how much bigger the, the aircraft looked at, you know, with the engine on the front. And we had the propeller back from Germany and that was mounted and that's a nice big nine foot propeller and it was beginning to look like a real airplane there and uh, these were big milestones to us. In the eight years reconstruction at Benson, the BF 109 G2 gradually changed into what we know today as Black Six. The team was joined in 1990 by Chris Starr, who had a special interest in large piston engines. I was passing through Benson and heard about it, and I got a, an interest in older aircraft and engineering and popped down the hangar and saw John Dixon. I was looking for something to do, actually. I was looking to be involved, so it was quite uh, a bit of providence there that um, I discovered the, uh, the 109 project, which really fitted my interest. The piston engine particularly has got a soul and a history, especially the Second World War. Big engines. And uh, the technical aspects of the, of the Mercedes really are complex. Uh, they're intriguing. And um, that's really why I've uh, centred on the engine. Also, the airframe was well looked after by John Dixon and Paul Blacker, particularly. Uh, the airframe work was mainly complete when I bumped into the project. By July 1990, the aircraft was almost complete and ready for its first engine run. Yes, we have this dream scenario that you work on this lovely old aircraft and you push it out and it's such a gentle little beast that when you push the appropriate switches and pull the appropriate toggles, it will immediately fire into life because it's nice that way. Um, we couldn't even get the thing to talk to us. Uh, we, the engine and the, the, Daim the Daimler Benz engine in the 109 is started by hand cranking a flywheel, and then the guy in the cockpit pulls switches and makes the magneto switches and all the rest of it, and introduces the fuel, of course, and then hopefully everything comes together and it fires. Now, we couldn't even get the propeller to turn the initial, and it was so frustrating, it's untrue. We used to take it out quite regularly and try and get it to start, and it wouldn't start, uh, <laughs> and then change plugs, look at the wiring. And there was weekend upon weekend upon weekend uh, during the summer of 1990 that we all turned up, all optimistic that this was the day the engine was going to fire and we couldn't even get the thing to cough. I think we'd just about given up all hope of it starting. It was about half past four, one wet and windy afternoon. It was coming to near dusk and I was absolutely shattered, as was the rest of the team, but we got this little cough. The propeller kicked and I thought, well, that's a sign of life. I think there was a puff of smoke out of one of the cylinder stubs, exhaust stubs. But I was so shattered, I thought, right, OK, we're getting somewhere. Call it a day. We'll pack it in and go home. And I was shouted down by about six other members of the team. In fact, I'm so surprised I survived the event, actually. I was nearly lynched, suggesting that we pack up, put it in the hangar and go home. And we persevered for about another half hour, and nothing happened, really, uh, despite many attempts. Uh, we tried one more go, and lo and behold, it fired. And I couldn't believe it. It was several seconds before I sort of get, regained sanity and started doing the job I was supposed to be doing, which was looking over Roger's shoulder into the cockpit at the instruments and seeing that everything was tickety-boo. Uh, it wasn't, but uh, nothing drastic. But having congratulated each other, I thought, well, perhaps it's a fluke, so we'll start it again. And we tried again, and it coughed, and I thought, here we go again. And after the second go, it fired, and we did another run. No leaks to speak of, no nothing. And we went home thoroughly delighted, thinking we're making progress. Little did we know it would take us several months later to get the thing to run the way it should run. 
it was to take a further eight months of testing and adjustment before the first flight could be made on the 17th of March, 1991. Well, the obvious uh, thing, of course, is who was going to fly it. There's a chap called Reg Hallam, who was group captain in charge of experimental flying at Farnborough, RAE Farnborough at the time, who uh, was not only highly qualified, Empire test pilot qualified, etc., but actually flew Spitfires and Mustangs and the Hispano 1112, which is the Spanish-built version of the aircraft with a Merlin engine on the front. So I first, of course, called him at home and suggested that he might like to fly the only 109 flying in the world. And he, uh, there was no hesitation whatsoever. He said, yes, please. The day it flew, of course, well, to be honest, it shouldn't have done on the day. It was a fairly yucky day and a bad strip. About a month before, uh, Benson had a little radar station put in and they dug up the grass strip and put a trench across it. The pilot had looked at it and he thought it was, uh, you know, good enough to uh, have a go at. So Le Reg, bless his heart, decided to take off. But the takeoff itself, well, that was something else. <laughs> there was a row of about five of us videoing this thing and mine was the only camera that kept working. And so I got the only footage there was of the actual first takeoff. The tail came up very quickly indeed, and I think it's fair to say within a few yards of it moving forward. Had full right rudder on to try and hold the aircraft. That didn't help. He had full right brake on, and that didn't help. And then he hit the first trench. And as he went over it, it sunk in, knocked him off about 40 degrees. I thought it was going to end up in a little heap at the end of the grass. I turned away and uh, just didn't watch. The blade touched the ground, and then he got airborne. And launched into the air Harrier style, and Reg, uh, with all his expertise managed to hold it there and pull it away. I thought we were going to have a smoking heap at the end of the day, but uh, Reg got it airborne. The next remark I had from him was over a little radio I had, Russ, goes like a train. The amazing thing after that was, as we subsequently found the propeller was damaged, is the way for 30 minutes it whipped about the skies, no problem at all. Uh, and he was very impressed with the performance. The heart was going, I don't know what rate, but ever so glad that it got airborne. Uh, but we had all sorts of little problems in the flight, and all of which was rectified later. When he came back down, he got out, and how did it go? And his first words were, it goes like a train. After that, uh, the propeller had to be repaired or replaced. I didn't think there was any chance of replacing it. So eventually it was shipped to Hoffmann Propellerwerk at, uh, in Germany, and they very kindly uh, straightened it for us and repainted it for us and this was all done within the space of a few working days. But uh, we had other problems because uh, having got the propeller back we discovered that uh, a couple of the exhaust valves in the engines had burned through. We had hoped at the official rollout ceremony which had then been planned by Ministry of Defence that we could fly it for the invited guests, some of whom of course were coming from Australia. But that was out the window. The rollout ceremony had been scheduled for quite some time and couldn't be postponed. The team had to continue as planned with the preparation of the 109, although on the day it was only to be seen on static display. Russ's detailed research into the origins of his 109 were now being proved. The exact camouflage, markings and insignia that had been displayed on Heinz Ludemann's Black Six 49 years before were restored in every detail. On the 2nd of May 1991, Black Six went on public view for the first time. The rollout ceremony was attended by many distinguished guests from the aircraft's past. Heinz Langer, nephew of Heinz Ludemann, the last Luftwaffe pilot to fly Black Six, who presented Russ with two of his uncle's decorations. Bobby Gibbs, the man who claimed his Gustav in 1942 as an Australian war trophy and had to give it up to the Royal Air Force. Doug Goff, pilot of the BF 109 G2 during its time with 1426 enemy aircraft flight. Following the rollout, Russ and the team rectified the engine problems in readiness for flight. During this time, Russ had been negotiating with the MOD, the agreement under which Black Six now operates at Duxford. I first ordered Benson before its first uh, air test, uh, and it struck me then uh, in fact, it hadn't even been finally, hadn't got its top coat of paint on. It was still in, in undercoat primer. Uh, but it struck me then that it was a very uh, professional and painstaking rebuild uh, by guys who not only knew what they were doing, but loved what they were doing. 
I knew there was a, a 109 uh, undergoing restoration. Uh, yes, I think it was, from my point of view anyway, um, a bit of a surprise when we were asked to uh, take over the operation of the aeroplane. Having given the undertaking to the people who rebuilt it, i.e. Russ and his team, uh, that they would fly it, uh, given that it was got back into flying condition, uh, the Air Force Board uh, considered that A, they had no funds to fly it within the Air Force, it also wasn't appropriate for a former enemy aircraft to be tacked onto the back end of the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight. And so they had to find uh, some instrument whereby the aircraft could find a home where it would be well looked after uh, and where it could actually fly in a meaningful sort of way for a period. And the Imperial War Museum was that instrument, really. On the 12th of July, 1991, the Gustav took off from Benson Airfield for the last time and flew to its present home. Imperial War Museum at Duxford. Black 6 completed its test flights at Duxford and flew in its first public display in September 1991. Russ's ambition was to return this aircraft to the condition it was in when Heinz Ludemann last flew it in 1942. The BF 109G continued to fly successfully from Duxford for the next two years. Charlie Brown, one of the three pilots rated on the aeroplane, flew it last in 1993. That was an air test, an annual air test, which was due. Um, everything, everything worked exactly according to plan. I first saw the 109 when it arrived from Benson, uh, with John Allison at the controls after its, uh, I believe it was its second flight, because Reg Hallam did the first, and uh, was very excited by the aeroplane because it was absolutely authentic and original. I'd never seen a restoration like it. But it came about through John Allison, really. John Allison's chief pilot with the aeroplane. Um, he decides exactly what's done and what isn't done with the aircraft. Um, the deputy pilot, if you like, is um, David Southwood, who's a test pilot. Um, one day, John Allison said to me, we'd actually been flying Spitfires together, would you like to fly the 109? And it was as simple as that. And I said, well, you can have the leg as well, if you like. Unfortunately, the next time I went to fly it, we broke the, the starter dog on startup on the crankshaft and so we've had a protracted um, engine maintenance program during last year. The starter dog on the back of the crankshaft split. The only way you've got to start the aircraft is through that starter dog. It's not accessible without stripping down the whole of the engine effectively. Whilst we had the, the rear gearbox off to get the starter dog off, we decided that we would try and cure some of the oil leaks we've been having through the season. So it involved taking off the, uh, the blocks and the pistons and when we took one of the blocks off five of the rings were broken so <laughs> that was a good start we could do without that work <laughs> during the winter the engine had undergone an extensive rebuild and was reaching the final stages in the engine workshop effectively the engine comes apart and the gearbox comes off the back and all to change the starter drive but these these are problems everybody seems to have with big piston engines uh, they are labour intensive and they do go wrong relatively regularly, is my experience so far. This time the airframe was in hangar two, awaiting the engine and final dressing. All the team members put in a lot of time and uh, I think like most, most adult people we have a, a train set to play with. This is my train set, other people have golf, or some people really do have train sets. I have to balance it um, as best I can, but it does come down to my wife and uh, her, her level of understanding. If somebody had come up to me in 1972 and said, here's an aeroplane, it's going to cost you a fortune, you're going to be given absolutely no assistance and stuck in the most god-awful places and it'll take you 20 years, how about it? I'd have told them where to go and what to do with this art. Uh, well, I love it. <laughs> and uh, as of... 19, October 93, I'm now a member of the Battle of Britain flight. During the week, I work on the BBMF, and at weekends, work on the Messerschmitt. Doesn't leave me a lot of time to do anything else. <laughs> I think my wife has become used to me disappearing for a couple of days on end, but it's taken 20 years to get this far. <laughs> By the end of April, the engine and airframe were reunited, and the final dressing and assembly had begun in preparation for an engine run the following day. On the 1st of May, Black 6 went out for the first engine run of the year. It was just possible that the 109 would take part in Duxford's D-Day air show, should all go well. At this point, a problem emerged. 
Fuel was leaking from the tank. It was too late to rectify it for the following day. Black Six sat out the air show while the team tried in vain to resolve their problem. The leak was to frustrate the team for several months to come, although several engine runs completed during May served to prove that the team's work on the engine had been successful. The fuel tank, though, after 50 years, proved to be irreparable. Russ and the team were faced with, at best, a long delay while funds were raised for a new tank, or at worst, the permanent grounding of the aeroplane and its return to static display at the Royal Air Force Museum in Hendon. I've always had a love of flying aeroplanes. To me, an aeroplane is, a historic aeroplane is a very attractive uh, thing to look at and to uh, appreciate, but you don't really get the full value of it until you see it in the air. Uh, so you can have a hall full of historic Spitfires, such as they've got at the Royal Air Force Museum at Hendon, uh, on all the Battle of Britain aircraft. They're very impressive, they're very uh, interesting, uh, particularly for people who have never seen them. But uh, they don't come alive until they get into their own environment. And the 109 were not that short of 109s. Yes, it's a fairly rare aeroplane, but there are no 109s flying. And we can afford to do it with one. We know the history. It should be up for the people to see. I'd like to see it carry on flying indefinitely, as long as the engine and as long as we can get spares for the engine or the airframe. It would be nice, I think, to keep it going until something else German or another 109 appears on the scene. And there's obviously work going in that direction now. There are a couple in the States being rebuilt to fly just now. But, uh that's the sum total of it, and when you consider that over 30,000 of these were built in all its various configurations and, and forms, uh, and there's only that small number left, it's a very minute proportion of perhaps, uh, you know, one of the most important aircraft of all times. Having kept the team together for so long, what will they do if their aeroplane is taken away from them? I think we shall disperse, most likely, one way or another. We, we'd like to carry on been associated with Duxford, to be honest with you. I think if you're going to do a restoration, you restore it to how it was like, what it was like, and you overcome the problems to make it, you know, as original as you can. It requires a goal to keep people together, and the goal is this aeroplane, which isn't which isn't privately owned, which is mm. publicly owned. It's, it's, it's nobody's aeroplane. Nobody profits from our work except perhaps the Imperial War Museum. The future of Black Six and the team hung in the balance until early June, when funds were allocated by the Imperial War Museum for a replacement fuel tank. This has just been one more problem for Russ and his team to solve out of the many they've faced over 22 years. Russ has already achieved what no one else has. This is the only aircraft, original German combat aircraft from World War II flying anywhere in the world. It makes me feel very responsible, I think. But nonetheless, I, I thoroughly enjoy um, the flying of it. I feel that the aircraft um, should be flown in a responsible way, in that its needs should be catered for in terms of warming the engine, looking after the technical side of the aircraft. But nonetheless, it is a fighter, and it should be demonstrated in a spirited manner. There isn't anything there, so any sop to safety through the whole thing. It's designed to do its job. So that has to be borne in mind by people who fly these days. There is a train of thought which I can fully understand, which says, really, if you've got no experience in that, you don't want to risk damaging this aircraft. But there's the other side of me. I've been a professional pilot for 30 years now, and uh, I reckon I'm fairly competent. And given adequate, suitable training, at least uh, I think I should uh, have a go at it, shall I say. Uh, having said that, have, if I don't have a go at it, then I'll never forgive myself. I'll, I'll end up a bit of a twisted old man, wondering why after 20 odd years working on the aircraft, I didn't fly the thing that uh, I was responsible for uh, causing to be rebuilt. But my primary intention was to restore it as accurately as I could. Uh, the secondary thing was just a little thought in the back of my head that if we found it was okay, why not fly it?
the lovely sound of a Merlin engine powering one of the beautifully restored aircraft based here at Duxford Aerodrome. It's a familiar sound to many of the quarter of a million visitors who come to this thriving part of the Imperial War Museum each year. But that aircraft, the Merlin that powers it, and its engine note are unique. The last surviving Sea Hurricane is powered by the only airworthy Merlin Mark III engine, making it the oldest Hurricane of any type flying anywhere in the world. Now based at Duxford, the Sea Hurricane Z7015 made its first flight for 52 years on the 17th of September 1995. Nine years, nine months, and nine days after the Sea Hurricane crew started work on this magnificent restoration project, giving a new lease of life to one of the world's rarest aircraft. David Lee, Duxford's deputy director, is responsible for all the Imperial War Museum's aircraft and decides how they best can be used to convey the museum's message. In the early 80s, we didn't have a hurricane at all at Duxford. Um, Duxford has always been felt to be spitfire orientated. And the hurricane has always been, a, in some ways, as far as Battle of Britain is concerned, and that was the most important period from Duxford's history. Uh, the hurricane was far more important than spitfire. And we've, we wanted to have a hurricane at Duxford. Uh, when the Shuttleworth collection were looking for somebody else to take on and work on the Sea Hurricane restoration, they approached us and we said, yes, all right, we'll, we'll give it a go. Chris Chippington, Duxford's conservation manager, coordinates the work of the volunteers and staff restoring the museum's aircraft. We're trying to uh, preserve as much as we can of the original uh, aircraft that uh, took place in, these, in this conflict so that future generations uh, understand what warfare was about and how it was conducted. All of our restoration conservation work is, is towards a static um, aircraft. The, the Sea Hurricane is unique in that it's, it's the only aircraft the museum has restored to flying condition. It's important, um, obviously because of its role in the Second World War and primarily its role in the Battle of Britain. Um, I think uh, the Hurricane in the public eye certainly has always taken second place to the Spitfire. Although restored and now maintained at Duxford, the Sea Hurricane will eventually return to join the other aircraft in this unique collection of airworthy aeroplanes at Old Warden Airfield in Bedfordshire. Jonathan Peel, Shuttleworth's general manager, oversees the running of the museum and the continued preservation of the collection. The, the process uh, that the Hurricane has now gone through is exactly the same process that, the, that our Spitfire Mark V went through. That was, that was originally restored here and spent some of its time um, alternating between here and here and Old Warden for the first few years of its life. As you know, it's now long-term based at Old Warden. The slogan that we've used for many years, time flies at Old Warden, applies just, <laughs> applies just as much to the people who work there as it does to what happens. The Shuttleworth Trust still own the airplane, yes. Um, the deal is basically if, if at any time in the future they decide to sell the aircraft, um, they have to offer, offer it to us first. And we have a quite considerable, I must admit, far more than I'd ever envisaged uh, stake in the aeroplane now in the amount of money we put in to bring it up to flying standard. In the latter stages, they have become much more involved in it, involved in, in the timber work, um, in the fabric work and the painting. So they have got more involved in, in the last year or so. Um, but most of 99% of the work has been done here at Duxford uh, with the, the present team. The Sea Hurricane restoration and its progress has, for many years, been a focal point for Duxford visitors. But now it's airworthy again. How will the Imperial War Museum operate a Shuttleworth aircraft? The Shuttleworth will operate it, and they'll provide the pilots and the, uh, and the operation of the aircraft. The first two years, it'll be based at Duxford, and operating from Duxford with the Shuttleworth uh, team maintaining it and operating it. Um, after that, the next two years, it'll be on a 50-50 basis, half-time here and half-time at Shuttleworth. We've left the period after that open. The agreement between the Shuttleworth Collection and the Imperial War Museum means that the Sea Hurricane's future is now secure. But this story is about its past, about the stubborn dedication of the Hurricane team and their nine years love-hate relationship with this aeroplane. Squadrons of the RAF are going to play a decisive part in winning the war. 
The history of the Sea Hurricane is just one chapter in the overall story of the Hawker Hurricane. To understand its evolution from a land-based fighter to carrier aircraft, we must go back to the origins of the Hawker Hurricane itself. Sir Sidney Cam's first military aircraft design was the Horsley, under the direction of W.G. Carter, chief designer at Hawker. His first design to be built in significant numbers was the metal-framed Hawker Hart. This was followed in 1930 by the Hawker Fury. Both aircraft were powered by the Rolls-Royce Kestrel engine, and several design variants and types were developed from them, including the Demon, the Ordak, Osprey, Hind and Hector. This ex-Afghan Air Force Hind, meticulously restored and flown by the Shuttleworth collection, is a fine example of CAM's design progression. It clearly shows the profile that was to emerge as the Hurricane. On the 6th of November 1935, the prototype Hurricane K5083, powered by a Rolls-Royce PV-12, or Merlin as we now know it, took to the air at Brooklands for its first test flight, piloted by Hawker's chief test pilot, PWS George Bullman. Based on the success of the test flights and in anticipation of an Air Ministry order, Cam proved his confidence in the Hurricane by setting up production at Kingston for a thousand aeroplanes. In December 1937, the first nine Hurricanes to enter Royal Air Force service joined Treble One Squadron at Northolt to replace their aging Gloucester gauntlets. These were the first out of an initial Air Ministry order for 600 that would increase over the next seven years to a production total of nearly 15,000 aircraft. The history of the Hurricane is an epic story too vast to relate in any one documentary. The Sea Hurricane, however, is a small but very important chapter in that story. The Hurricane was never intended for carrier duties. Its evolution from land to sea was out of necessity rather than foresight. That CAM's rugged design was quickly adapted for fleet air arm use when needed is further credit to its versatility. At the outbreak of the Second World War, the fleet air arm was a very young branch of the Royal Navy. Hugh Popham, fleet air arm historian who flew the Sea Hurricane in combat, explains. Well, you've got to go back really to the 1917 when the the, the old Royal Naval Air Service was merged by smuts of all people with what was then the Royal Flying Corps, so that there was one service. It's already a service of great tradition. In the last war, as the Royal Flying Corps, it was part of the army, and as such... Performed... Jan Christian Smuts was a South African general who drew up the plan in 1917 for a single air force that would absorb both the Royal Flying Corps and the Royal Naval Flying Service. His plan was accepted by the War Cabinet and the Royal Air Force was the result. His plan worked well for the formation and development of a land-based air force, but was to have serious consequences for the future of flying in the Royal Navy. The Navy had no control over its own pilots, aircraft or anything else until later on, until the 30s really. It wasn't until 1937 that the Royal Navy regained control of the fleet air arm, but the transition was far from smooth. Officers with flying experience were few, and the naval aircraft issued to the fleet air arm were old and of obsolete design. It wasn't until just before the war that the fleet air arm got its own service and its own aeroplanes, but of course by then it was too late because all available that aircraft manufacturer was going to the RAF. The main frontline carrier aircraft were the Skewer, Albacore, Fulmar and Swordfish, like this beautifully restored and maintained pair operated by the Royal Navy's historic flight. The fascinating thing about the Fleet Air Army is that it had rotten aeroplanes. It was a, when I knew it first, it was a small service, but it always had this feeling of terrific spirit. I think partly because the aeroplanes were so awful, you know. The Admiralty's attitude to aircraft was as it was to ships. They should never be built for a single purpose or flown by a single pilot without observer or navigator. 
Well, the idea was originally that they would spot for the guns of the battleships. I mean, this was there, plus uh, a certain amount of reconnaissance, and then eventually torpedo carrying. The necessity for dedicated fighter aircraft had never been envisaged by the Admiralty at the outbreak of war, and in fact, their use had been ruled out after exploratory tests at the Royal Aircraft Establishment with hurricanes. The Admiralty didn't believe you could, let, you could operate a single-seater monoplane from a carrier. They were to be proved wrong in the Norwegian campaign by the Royal Air Force. In June 1940, 46 Squadron's Hurricanes had been shipped to Norway to cover the troop evacuations and had been successfully flown off the aircraft carrier HMS Glorious to operate from hurriedly prepared airfields in Norway. Following the rapid German advance, Squadron de Cross received orders to either destroy his Hurricanes or send them with the ground crews to the far north coast. Here the aircraft would, if possible, be dismantled and shipped home by freighter. Cross considered both plans to be a waste of valuable aeroplanes. Following consultations with the captain of Glorious, flew 46 Squadron's 10 Hurricanes out to the carrier, now steaming at maximum speed into wind. They'd weighted their Hurricanes tails with sandbags in the rear fuselage, but in the event, they all landed on with plenty of deck to spare. All 10 of 46 Squadron's Hurricanes landed on board Glorious with only one minor incident, damage to Cross's tailwheel. Sadly, Glorious was caught en route to Britain by the German capital ship Scharnhorst and her escort Neisner, and sunk with the loss of all aircraft and 1,515 men. Only 43 survived, including Squadron Leader Cross and his flight lieutenant Jameson, both of whom went on to have long and distinguished careers in war and peace. It was tragic, really. but I think that was a very important event because if the RAF could do it without hooks, then surely the Fleet Air Arm could do it, you know, on a proper aircraft carrier with hooks and all the rest of it. One other significant chapter in the Sea Hurricane story was prompted by the menace of the Focke-Wulf 200 Condor long-range reconnaissance bombers operating out of Bordeaux, Merignac, which were harassing convoys in the Atlantic, far from the reach of shore-based fighters. The first solution to this problem was for ships to be fitted with catapult rails, on which a fighter could be launched for one attack on the shadowing condor. This left the pilot with the choice of flying to any land within range or parachuting back to the ship after combat. The fleet air arm was equipped first with four fighter catapult ships, ex-banana boats with Royal Navy crews and pilots of 804 Squadron fleet air arm. Late in 1940, 35 Mark I Hurricanes were converted with catapult spools for use on fighter catapult ships. CAM, or Catapult Armed Merchant Ships, were similar to the fleet air arms, but cargo-carrying ships, crewed by merchant seamen and volunteer Royal Air Force pilots from the newly formed Merchant Ship Fighter Unit at Speak, Liverpool. These were the first Sea Hurricanes, or Hurricats. But in the event, they were seldom used in anger. Out of the 200 CAM ships planned for in 1940, only 35 were ever converted, sailing on 175 convoy protection voyages. I mean, a cam ship, you know, it was a terrible decision to have to fire this thing off. You knew that was the only one you had, and you wouldn't get it back. But then, of course, from there, we moved into, uh, into the Woolworth carriers, mostly American, which were a lot better than ours, actually, because I served in one of them, the Campania, which was a British one. It was terrible. But, uh, they, uh, we gradually drew in all these American Woolworth carriers, and that was the beginning of proper convoy protection, all the rest of it. A further link with the fleet air arm that's made Duxford an appropriate place to restore the Sea Hurricane is the secondment of naval pilots to Royal Air Force squadrons during the Battle of Britain. One of the fleet air arm pilots, based here under Douglas Bader, was Lieutenant R.J. Cork. 
He gained his first experience flying hurricanes for the Royal Air Force long before they were introduced to the fleet air arm. Cork served here with distinction and went on to become the Navy's top scoring pilot, flying sea hurricanes, but sadly he was killed in a flying accident in 1944. By late 1940, it became apparent to all concerned that there was, contrary to naval philosophy, a great need for a high-speed, single-seat, carrier-based fighter. The Hurricane, with its rugged versatility, was the only suitable aircraft available in sufficient quantities for conversion. And in 1941, the fleet air arm started converting pilots. Men with hurricane experience, like Cork, were to smooth a hurried transition and lead the way with tactics learnt in combat during the Battle of Britain. The first true sea hurricane with a rester hook, catapult spools and naval radio fit completed test flights following conversion of a prototype by Hawkers. The subsequent sea hurricane conversions were handed over to General Aircraft Limited at Hanworth who produced their first Sea Hurricanes by mid-1941 and went on to complete nearly 700 conversions for the Royal Navy. This aircraft was one of that first batch converted. And out of the 700 Sea Hurricanes, it's the only one left in existence. Researching Z7015's own personal history has taken Owen Dinsdale, the team's historian, almost as long as the restoration itself. It was started here by another team that the Duxford Aviation Society put together. We took it over as a, a kit of parts. Keith and I have a the saying that we start off with a colour scheme and work back from that. Records proved that this aircraft's centre section had been laid down at the Hawker Aircraft Works Kingston as a Mark I Hurricane in 1939. But this was the first twist in the tale, as no further records existed until a standard Mark I Hurricane recorded as Z7015 arrived from Canada nearly two years later. In an effort to secure a safe manufacturing base away from the impending war in Europe, Hawker signed an agreement with Canadian Car and Foundry, based at Fort William, or Thunder Bay as it's now called, in Ontario, Canada. Every drawing, part and jig of the Kingston assembly line was microfilmed and shipped to Canada. There is a possibility that the 1939 Kingston-built centre section was shipped out to Fort William as well, as a pattern for the 1,451 Hurricanes that were built over the next three years in Canada. Returning to Britain as part of the complete Hurricane Z7015 in 1941. This is one possible solution to the Hurricanes British-Canadian cross-breeding. The other is that the entire centre section was replaced during repairs following a landing accident, not as unlikely as it might seem. The Hurricane Repair Organisation would often recycle or amalgamate major parts from two or more damaged aircraft to create one serviceable Hurricane. It's unlikely that the truth will ever be revealed, but with or without the Kingston centre section, proof does exist that Z7015 was the 93rd Canadian Hurricane completed by the Canadian Car and Foundry production lines. It made its maiden flight from Fort William Airport on the 18th of January, 1941. A stroke of luck, the original test flight documents were found in 1994 and sent to David Lee by David Birch of the Rolls-Royce Heritage Trust. They showed that Z7015 first took to the air on five occasions, on the 18th and 19th of January 1941. That these documents should emerge 53 years later is entirely due to an oil temperature problem that Z7015 experienced and which was rectified during test flights. This hurricane 
returned to Britain in 1941 and was allotted to Royal Air Force Henlow on the 18th of March from where it went to another maintenance unit at Kemble. Its brief Royal Air Force life ended on June the 27th when it went to General Aircraft Limited at Hanworth for conversion to a Sea Hurricane 1B. It was accepted by the fleet air arm at Yeovilton on the 29th of July, 1941. It went to the first fleet air arm squadron that was equipped with uh, Sea Hurricanes, 880 Squadron, and uh, operated with them and was due to go on to HMS uh, Indomitable when she was commissioned. Squadron records show that at about this time, A flight, under the squadron commander, Lieutenant Commander FEC Butch Judd, embarked on the carrier HMS Furious for the attack on Petsamo. The rest of the squadron, including Z7015, appears to have visited most of the aerodromes in Orkley and Shetland, under the charge of senior pilot Lieutenant WH Moose Martin. After A Flight's return, 880 were based at Sumbra, and the records show that Sub Lieutenant Hugh Popham flew Z7015 five times in this period. On the 13th of October 1941, 880 Squadron were embarked onto the newly completed carrier Indomitable. Z7015 left Sumbra, as can be seen in the squadron record book, on the 7th of October. But it's not amongst the Sea Hurricanes that arrived on the carrier. This disappearance from records remains a mystery. The next definite sighting was in April 1942 at David Rosenfield Limited, a civilian repair organisation at Barton, Manchester, where the aircraft appears to have undergone major repairs, including work on the undercarriage. From December 42 to mid 43, it was on 759 Squadron, which is the fighter, advanced fighter school at Yeovilton and towards the end of 43 it went to Loughborough College as an instructional airframe, which is the other reason it survived. <laughs> On the 21st of February 1961, Loughborough College exchanged the Sea Hurricane 1B and a Spitfire 5C for a jet provost with the Shuttleworth collection, and Z7015 took its place here at Old Warden Aerodrome amongst these historic aircraft. The Sea Hurricane, now in the guise of a Mark I Royal Air Force Hurricane, and together with the Spitfire, took up position on static display outside Old Warden. Norman Gardner, project coordinator of the Sea Hurricane restoration, encountered it here in the early 1960s. Unbeknown to him then, it was to be the start of a very long association. The first time I ever saw what I thought was a Hurricane Mark I, was when it stood alongside a Spitfire PR-11 uh, adjacent to the gates, which was the entrance to the old Warden Aerodrome of the Shuttleworth Collection. And we were mesmerised. Cool, look at this. A Hurricane and a Spitfire. Oh, they do look operational, don't they? Well, the Spitfire looks a bit better than the Hurricane. <laughs> yeah, shame they're outside. The Hurricane remained at Old Warden until 1967 when all Second World War aircraft that could be made serviceable were once again recalled for duties with the Royal Air Force at Henlow. It was here that Norman and the Sea Hurricane were to meet again. Because I used to help the Royal Air Force riggers and fitters who were working on the Battle of Britain film with us uh, to help run the engine then and blank off the radiator, which uh, uh, actually we never succeeded in getting it airworthy. And incidentally, I might say at this point, what a good job. Because we didn't know at that time that the Hurricane tailplane spar was as corroded as it was. So <laughs> there's some weird and wonderful things happen. <laughs> the radiator failure prevented certain disaster. Had Z7015 flown for the cameras in 1968, the tail spar would have disintegrated. Following the Battle of Britain film, the Sea Hurricane returned to Old Warden and remained there on static display until 1975, 
when its path and Normans were to cross again at the Doughty airfield, Staverton in Gloucestershire. The, uh, the late 1970s, when I worked for, um, for my sins, I was working for the Doughty Flying Unit as its service manager uh, under the uh, direction of squadron leader Neville Duke, of Hawker Hunter fame in particular. And um, I think it was largely due to Air Commodore Wheeler's um, association with Sir George Doughty uh, that Doughty's were asked if they could possibly help in the restoration of the Sea Hurricane. Air Commodore Alan Wheeler, Shuttleworth's aviation trustee at the time, had earlier engaged Doughty's to refabric the collection's Gloucester Gladiator and had been impressed with the results. Unfortunately, uh, although there was no obstacles put in our way, um, by the time we got to the tower plane of the Sea Hurricane at that time, uh, we found it totally corroded. There was absolutely no hope after all sorts of inquiries throughout the UK and the world of replacing the tower plane spire. And that particular project fell through. And that was a great disappointment to me. And the aeroplane was taken in bits back to Old Warden. And there it remained until 1981. Apart from the wings, which were restored by British Airways at Heathrow in 1980, in readiness should a restoration of the airframe be successful. The Shuttleworth Collection were looking for somebody else to take on and work on the Sea Hurricane restoration. They approached us and we said, yes, all right, we'll, we'll give it a go. So the aircraft came across here in pieces, basically, in, in 1982, I think it was. The Hurricane had arrived at the Imperial War Museum and went into what is now Hangar 5, and some uh, volunteers, quite keen chappies, uh, from DAS started working on the airframe. That team never really worked or never really got together to really achieve very much, mainly because we didn't put very much resource into it, we hadn't got much to put into it. Really, I suppose I deliberately said, until we can get a proper team and a proper funding arrangements, then it's never going to happen. A new agreement with Shuttleworth was reached in 1986, and Norman Gardner was appointed as project coordinator. I said to uh, David Lee, who is deputy director here at Duxford, um, what's happened to the Spitfire crew? This particular crew was responsible for this beautifully restored Spitfire Mark 5C belonging to the Shuttleworth collection and had worked on several other restoration projects that included the Shuttleworth Anson and Spitfire PR-11. But they were reluctant to get involved in, in, in another Shuttleworth aircraft. I suppose David Lee takes quite a, a lump of uh, recognition for his efforts to get this Spitfire crew working so that they eventually, I hope, will become known as the Sea Hurricane crew. <laughs> The crew first assembled in January 1986 in what for the next eight years would become known as the Sea Hurricane Workshop. Keith Taylor, crew chief and Merlin engine specialist, thought their involvement with the Sea Hurricane would only be brief. He was going to do the engine only for a start. That was when we found out we'd got the wrong one. Yeah. And <laughs> we uh, got this one in and Somehow we ended up with all of it. I don't know quite how that happened, to be honest, but uh, yeah. well, when we first saw it, it, it wasn't a hurricane. It was just lots of tea chests and lots of spare bits. Steve McManus, deputy crew chief, had tried to get his hands on the sea hurricane in the past. The hurricane was sitting over at Old Warden looking rather forlorn, and uh, we went over and asked whether we could do that. And they said, no, that's already going down to Staverton to a team down there. So when we got involved with it, it was like a giant airfix kit without any instructions. Well, initially, of course, the first thing one does, and the crew didn't need any supervision on this, was to do an inventory on what bits there were left, because it wasn't by any means complete by this stage, having travelled all over the country. Before restoration could start, the previous attempts at rebuilding the centre section and fuselage had to be dismantled for inspection. The rear end of it, where it had been sitting down in the grass, was quite heavily corroded. A lot of the steel tubes were quite heavily corroded. And some effort had been made to 
let them go with certain repairs around them. For instance, they put clamped plates around some of the tubes to try and reinforce them. But when we looked at them, we thought, well, that's only building in trouble for the future. So um, the best answer is to take it totally to pieces, which is what we did. And the lad started working on decorroding uh, all the tubes. And some of them were so pitted, so corroded pitted, that if you'd have removed it, you'd have gone right through the wall of the tube. So it was decreed that we should replace them. Now, you can't do this without reference to a licensed engineer. And this was where Mr. Norman Chapman was involved and retained by the Imperial War Museum as the licensed engineer on the project. Norman had also acted as licensed engineer on the crew's previous Spitfire project. They knew that his contribution to the project was not just his CAA recognition. He also brought with him years of first-hand knowledge of veteran aircraft, stretching back to his first involvement with Hurricanes in 1940. I mean, all I'm virtually doing is to see that uh, the lads are putting the right bolts in the right holes at the right time, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and that's what it's basically um, is tied down to, is certification of all the bits that go into the aeroplane. Because when I took it over, there was just no paperwork, nothing. So I said, right, we start from scratch. We literally stripped it to the extent that it was just a heap of tubes sitting around in here, then inspected every tube, cleaned it inside and out, and then made the decision whether the tube was a goer or not. You know, we, we didn't even know what the parts were in many cases when we picked them up. In fact, we did have one party of people came in here some years ago and said, uh, we heard you've got a hurricane in here. We said, yeah, you've just walked over it. <laughs> the Spitfire crew were now turning into the Sea Hurricane crew. But had the vast differences in construction of the two aircraft caused them any problems? The Spitfire's construction was, I'm going to get shot down, I know, but it was simpler for a modern trained engineer to work, to put together. It was a simpler method. It was, it was, it was modern. Absolutely different from the Spitfire. The Spitfire is all stress skin structure, all metal structure. This one is a generation before, a steel tube forming the structural members of the aeroplane, then wood formers to give it shape, stringers that you can then locate the fabric on, and then a fabric covering. Uh, there were one or two heads scratched about, um, well, surely they didn't do it like this. How did they do? They got tubes inside it. Having made a detailed inventory and assessed the condition of the major components, the crew then began reconstruction in 1987. The first major task was to replace the four corroded longitudinal fuselage tubes that run from the cockpit to tail. In line with the standard Hawker procedure, the tube ends had to be squared. This was the crew's first major challenge. The original tube squaring machine had only just recently been dismantled by hawkers at Kingston, and we were stuck. That was difficult. It took us about six months to solve, to get a machine up and running that would actually work and square the tubes to the dimensions we wanted. Anyway, two engineers who were uh, doing part-time work on the airfield under contract uh, came up with a wonderful idea, which was as, uh, as near the original as it possibly could be, and we were able to square the tubes. This gave a great impetus because, of course, this allowed us now to rebuild the hall of the fuselage. During 1987, the undercarriage legs, doghouse assembly and radiator were sent away for refurbishment as parts requiring specialist attention, and the crew concentrated on the hurricane centre section and fuselage. Replace, refurbish everything you could on the fuselage primary structure. The tubular structure, which the lay man never sees because it's covered over. We started to reassemble with new tubes as necessary. So first of all, with the centre section, and then the fuselage structure around the pilot's area and engine subframe. A lot of work involved, a great deal of work, because the structure is wire braced. It has crisscrosses where you true up the structure you've now built 
and that, that's quite involved. We gradually sort of built from the centre section backwards until we arrived at the back end. A problem the crew knew they would have to face eventually was the irreparable corrosion in the tail spar that had halted the first restoration attempt at Staverton in the late 1970s. Luckily, uh, there were other hurricanes in the same problem. Um, Cranfield College had done a mod where they replaced the um, rolled steel spar with a circular spar and put plate webs on the side. And really, because we didn't tackle it immediately, but we left it sort of hanging up on the ceiling for a while, by the time we got round to looking at it, Cranfield already had a solution. And it was just a case of shipping it over there and getting it done. During 1988, the primary structure was rebuilt, complete with the centre section containing the fuel tanks and the radiator, rebuilt by Cambridge Radiator. Uh, the next major problem was woodwork. Originally, it was going to be rebuilt for us by a firm called Morris Bayliss, but unfortunately, uh, we only got as far as the doghouse with them, and uh, because of timescales, we had to uh, bring the woodwork back here and do it ourselves. With the assistance uh, of the museum, we were able to engage a, 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 a skilled and licensed uh, aircraft woodworker, and he came, and, and by Jove, he, he, he made a big difference and we set up all the jigs on big pieces of plywood to make all the various shapes and formers. Luckily, the originals, though virtually falling to pieces, were good enough to be able to take patterns off, and we just left them rather long if they were a bit broken at the ends and uh, sorted it out when we fitted it to the aircraft. Many months were spent laying out the wood frames and offering them up to the fuselage until they fitted correctly. And by the time the doghouse assembly returned in 1989, the Sea Hurricane was beginning to look like an aeroplane once again. In 1990, Keith Taylor's major challenge on this restoration started. His task was to make the original Merlin 3 engine serviceable. That's a piston. And it's got about a six inch stroke. There's 12 of these in there. And they're in a V formation, two rows of six. Six there and six over this side. valves as you can see there's four per cylinder there's two inlet valves and two exhaust valves they open they come out there into exhaust stubs this is the camshaft that works these valves through the medium of these fingers they ride on the camshaft proper which is driven by that wheel that's uh, obviously the heart of the engine all crankshafts are in all engines of course it comes up to the reduction gear up to the front and uh, this is a big wheel which is turned by a small wheel, which reduces the speed of the propeller to about two and a half times. But I think you know to a certain extent when you're putting it together, you, you see what you've got, so to speak, and we know that the engine is good, everything is correct, and uh, in fact the chap that actually helped design it has been down and looked at it. We had to um, call on the services of uh... Alec Harvey Bailey, who was uh, sort of Mr Merlin at Rolls-Royce during the war, to, uh, to come and give us his opinion on the condition of the engine. He's you know, certified that it's, it's more or less as good as new. Fortunately, the CAA uh, were happy to accept his, uh, his recommendations. During the 18 months the engine refurbishment took to complete, work continued on the rest of the airframe. The electrical and hydraulic systems were now installed in the centre section, and work continued on the wooden frames. By September 1991, the Merlin III was rebuilt and finished in its original Rolls-Royce paint scheme, ready to be reunited with the Sea Hurricane. After years of work, the wooden formers were now ready to be placed permanently on the fuselage. First, the wooden frames or formers are attached to the steel tubes that run from the centre section to the tail, and then the long, thin longerons that support the fabric are joined onto the frames. While the woodwork progressed, the tail section was sent to Shuttleworth, where Chief Engineer Chris Morris supervised the refabricating of the control surfaces. Back at Duxford, the team set about one of the more unusual aspects of this restoration, the arrestor hook. Whilst in service, Sea Hurricanes had a simple method of hook deployment, 
released the hook, and it dropped, ready to catch the wires on the carrier deck. It would be clipped back into place by riggers on the deck. But for safety reasons, Z7015's hook had to be capable of being deployed and retrieved from the cockpit during a display flight. Several ideas were thought up and tried until they hit on the idea of a pneumatic valve operated by the pilot that pushed the hook out against a spring. Releasing the pressure brings it back into its retracted position. During this period, the team inspected the wings. These had been refurbished by British Airways long before this restoration project started and following a detailed examination were found to be in need of cleaning and painting but otherwise fully serviceable. It wasn't until early 1993 that Chris Morris and Andy President could come over from Shuttleworth to start replacing the outer fabric. This process, known as bagging, requires the Irish linen to be draped over the fuselage, stretched over the formers and longerons, and then be stitched in place. Once the fabric is in place, six coats of red dope are applied, each coat drying and shrinking the fabric to the wood to give a smooth, taut, aerodynamic finish to the fuselage. The process is finished with a final coating of silver dope, ready for spraying with the camouflage scheme. The team had known all along that this project couldn't be finished in the workshop, and as work progressed, the Sea Hurricane got bigger and the workshop smaller. Before the wings could be fitted or the undercarriage extended, Z7015 would have to move into the restoration hangar. On the 13th of March, 1994, the Sea Hurricane left the workshop where it had arrived eight years before as a collection of corroding metal and unusable wood and took up a new position in Duxford's restoration hangar. For the first time since restoration started, Z7015 was taken off its temporary legs and was able to stand on its refurbished undercarriage. Over the next few weeks, a mass of jobs were carried out on the airframe, the legs were resealed, and the wings that had been taken off so many years ago were replaced. The painstaking job of reaming out for the wing root bolts was to take until the end of June 1994. Once on and secured, the wings were painted, the propeller was replaced, and now, for the first time, the Sea Hurricane looked very close to flight. On the 23rd of July, 1994, Duxford Aerodrome echoed to a sound not heard there in many years. The team's work on the engine had paid off, and on the second attempt, the world's only working Merlin III burst into life. The work was not over yet, though. Several more engine runs were needed, and a growing list of minor jobs and adjustments were necessary before the Sea Hurricane would be ready for flight. During the autumn of 1994, a party of very distinguished visitors came to Duxford. In 1941, they'd all served with 880 Squadron of the Fleet Air Arm, and as such, they had a special reason to see the last remaining Sea Hurricane. Paddy Brownlee, Jack Gibson Smith and Hugh Popham all flew Sea Hurricanes during World War II, and Hugh even flew Z7015. Today, the Sea Hurricane has been restored exactly as the aeroplanes they flew on the Malta bound convoy Operation Pedestal, as a tribute to them and to the many men who lost their lives in that desperate struggle. No, I couldn't believe it seeing it again. Yeah. When I'd actually flown this thing. Yeah. What strikes us most is the size of the beast. It's quite extraordinary, yeah. actually. We have no recollection of it being anywhere near as big as this. No, yeah. extraordinary. And the problems of even getting into it. <laughs> That's partly old age, Jack. Well, it must be old age. They get progressively worse, the old age. But having trained just before going on the Hurricanes on battles... I think, so was I, yes. I think we were absolutely thrilled to fly the Hurricane. 
That was, yes. That's my memory. <coughs> yes, really. how right you are, yes. Yeah. The thing about this was it had a decent strong undercarriage, which the see if I did not have. Yes. <laughs> I think it was much more yeah. ro robust, really. Really no. much robust, much stronger yeah. altogether. Yeah. <laughs> I think probably the most dramatic uh, episode in all our lives, in each of our three lives, mm -hmm. uh, was actually uh, the, the climax of pedestal. Operation Pedestal was the last big convoy sent in August 1942 to resupply Malta. The tiny but vital island had endured months of unrelating air attacks by shore-based Luftwaffe units from Italy, Sicily and Sardinia. The convoy of 14 merchant ships included the tanker Ohio, carrying vital fuel supplies for Malta's own Spitfire, Hurricane and Swordfish squadrons. The merchantmen were protected by the battleships Rodney and Nelson, aircraft carriers Victorious, Eagle, and Indomitable, carrying Paddy, Hugh, and Jack in 880 Squadron. At 20 hundred hours on the 11th of August, Indomitable Sea Hurricanes were scrambled for the second time that day to intercept incoming hostile aircraft. We were caught up uh, in, the, in the sort of dusk attack on the fleet, and we'd been up flying for an hour plus, or something. Yeah. and we'd been involved with some JU-88s. That's right, yeah. And our fuel was very low, to say the least. And the fleet were firing at us any, anyway. Every, yeah, time we, we, we Every time we got near the fleet, they fired at us. Yeah. <laughs> and they, they the tracer were fire. coming up like this, <laughs> <laughs> going <laughs> All my tanks were eating. No, and um, no question the last it. memory I have of was uh, this man saying, I'm out of fuel. <laughs> I'm, I can see the shadow of a carrier below me. I'm going to make a pass at it. And it was Victorious, who at that particular moment was steaming downwind, for the captain being um, on the board, tried to turn into wind. He started to turn. Started to turn into wind. The result was that Hugh made the pass at the carrier. And of course, as it was turning hard to starboard, he overshot the, run, uh, the, the flight, deck. <laughs> flight deck and came in from the starboard beam. And by the grace of God, there were two hurricanes parked and outriding. They were very effective landing gear, actually. <laughs> Landed in the middle, immediately caught fire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And is alleged to have then gone up to the commander flying, saluted smartly and said, please, sir, I've just landed on. <laughs> <laughs> Paddy and Jack found their ship despite the almost impossible conditions, and Hugh remained stranded on Victorious for the remainder of the operation. That was a terrible night. Mm because I hadn't got an aeroplane, so the next day I was out of it, really. And Jack and I managed to get back to Endon, and uh, one way or another. And here we are, the three old contemptible. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Part of the, yeah. the hurricane side. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Even though the Navy lost the carrier Eagle and two cruisers, and only five merchant ships out of 14, including the tanker, made it through to Malta, Operation Pedestal was deemed to be a success and kept the tiny island of Malta supplied so as to fight on against almost impossible odds. During the winter of 1994-95, a new and unexpected problem emerged with the propeller. One blade was found to be loose in its adapter. For a while, it looked as if this would mean a long delay. But then a set of blades was located and acquired by the museum. The original hub and new blades were refurbished and assembled by Michael Barnett of Skycraft and eventually returned to Duxford on the 24th of June to be refitted and tested in an engine run on that day. On the 23rd of July, Shuttleworth test pilot John Lewis arrived at Duxford for Z7015's first taxi test. And for the first time in many years, Z7015 was mobile under its own power. All that remained now was for the CAA to inspect the Sea Hurricane and, if satisfied, issue a permit to test before it could fly. Over the years, Norman Chapman and the team had certified every part, component and assembly of the restoration. These all had to be checked and approved. This meticulous attention to detail paid off on the 5th of September when the CAA's inspector spent a day with the team going over the Sea Hurricane and its accompanying mountain of paperwork.
The 17th of September, 1995, is almost exactly 54 years and eight months since Z7015 first flew in Canada. Almost 45 years after that, the Sea Hurricane team started work on this aeroplane. And exactly nine years, nine months, and nine days later, they would hope to see it fly. Mid-morning, Rolls-Royce test pilot Andy Sefton arrived from Old Warden. We'll do a ground run, uh, just to try out the handling of the engine, um, provided everybody is happy, including myself, and I'll taxi out. If I'm happy with the taxiing, then I'll get airborne, which will be out in that direction. I'll try and turn her before we hit the concrete, but if it doesn't turn very well, I don't want to go through that bad patch over there, so I'll take her onto the tarmac and taxi on the tarmac. Probably lift off about half well. Yeah, <laughs> we're off. Sefton has many hours on Spitfires, but had never before flown a Hurricane. Similar types of flown are the uh, Spitfire uh, P-51 and the Bearcat. Uh, in terms of power, it's not as powerful as the others, but it exhibits the same handling characteristics. The idea of a test program is to prove an aeroplane to make sure it's safe to operate. Um, on the first flight, all you're trying to do is make sure the thing works basically. your discretion northerly 10.
on the after flight smile now. Oh, yeah. Not the grimace. <laughs> not the in flight grimace that I normally give. <laughs> That's good. So, Thank you. <laughs> but well done. Thank you very much Thank indeed. You. Thank you. That's good. I need a cup of tea. I don't know about you. <laughs> I've got over that now it's landed. Yes. I'm very, very happy. It's nine years, nine months, nine days since we started the restoration. Shall we do it's another delighted. one, Mr. Lee? No. no. <laughs> Can't afford to do another one. <laughs> the Sea Hurricane team's dedication to this project and their determination to see this, one of the world's rarest aircraft, fly again, will bring pleasure to and admiration from the thousands of people who will see it fly long after Z7015's restoration crew are gone. Thank you.